Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's a beautiful morning here in the Philippines with the birds singing and the locusts chirping, and I'm sitting under the shade of a beautiful tree. And and all of these are fresh reminders of God's constant protection and watch care over us. Before we begin our study this evening, I'd like to invite you to uh, a word of prayer with me. Our Father in heaven, as we seek the study of your word, we need a special outpouring of thy Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into truth, to dethrone our preconceived ideas and hard-heartedness, and we pray that that you will speak your words to us through your servant, put your, your spirit in his lips, and may he speak words of heavenly origin. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. The title of our message this evening is His Truth Shall Be Thy Shield and Buckler. We want to do an introduction to the specific truths found in Revelation and I wish to share some observations. Turning to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, to begin with, we read, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. God pronounces a blessing on those that make the book of Revelation a special study. God wants us to understand those things. And he promises to bless us if we study them. We read in the Review and Herald, August 17, 1897, Those who eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God will bring from the books of Daniel and Revelation truth that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. They will start into action forces that cannot be repressed. The lips of children will be opened to proclaim the mysteries that have been hidden from the minds of men. The Lord has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. Here's a tremendous promise that that if we are eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of God, we will bring from the books of Daniel and Revelation truth that is inspired by the Holy Spirit and start into action forces that cannot be repressed. That's a, a beautiful promise. And I pray that this will be the case in the next couple of evenings. Seventh-day Adventists have long treasured the book Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. It has done a tremendous work in shedding light on the prophecies and the truth for this time. The spirit of prophecy has endorsed the book very highly. And this has also helped to give it its prominent place in our hearts and in our teachings. But... Here I want to present a caution and a counterbalance, if you will. I believe that some people have taken these endorsements too far. Some have elevated the book to a level of inspiration, which I don't believe it should have. It should not be considered to be perfect and to have no error, and I want to show you why. This is necessary, I believe, because we may be seeing some things slightly different in our study of the book of Revelation than we have perhaps believed in the past. Some things slightly different than are presented in this old-time book, this treasure that we have held. I believe that the book Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith should not be considered to be perfect and to have no error. But let's look at the endorsement first. Quote, I know that thoughts on Daniel and Revelation has done a great work in this country. End quote. That's from pamphlet 79, page 10. And again, quote, The light given was that thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation, great controversy, and patriarchs and prophets would make their way. They contained the very message the people must have, the special light God has given his people. The angels of God would prepare the way for these books in the hearts of men. And that's found in Publishing Ministry, page 206. And again, quote, I consider that the book 
thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, should go everywhere. It has its place and will do a grand good work. And this is from Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 60. Continuing on now the next few quotes from the same place. Quote, let our canvassers urge this book upon the attention of all. The Lord has shown me that this book will do a good work in enlightening those who become interested in the truth for this time. Those who embrace the truth now, who have not shared in the experiences of those who entered the work in the early history of the message, should study the instruction given in Daniel and the Revelation, becoming familiar with the truth it presents. And again, next paragraph, those who are preparing to enter the ministry, who desire to become successful students of the prophecies, will find Daniel and the Revelation an invaluable help. They need to understand this book. It speaks of past, present, and future, laying out a path so plain that none need to err therein. Those who will diligently study this book will have no relish for the cheap sentiments presented by those who have a burning desire to get out something new and strange to present to the flock of God. The rebuke of God is upon all such teachers. They need that one teach them what is meant by godliness and truth. The great essential questions which God would have presented to the people are found in Daniel and Revelation and the Revelation. There is found solid eternal truth for this time. Everyone needs the light and information it contains. And again, the interest in Daniel and the Revelation is to continue as long as probationary time shall last. God used the author of this book as a channel through which to communicate light, to direct minds to the truth. Should we not appreciate this light which points us to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King? And once more, now has come the time of the revelation of the grace of God. Now is the gospel of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed. Satan will seek to divert the minds of those who should be established, strengthened, and settled in the truths of the first, second, and third angels' messages. The students in our schools should carefully study Daniel and the Revelation, so that they shall not be left in darkness and the day of Christ overtake them as a thief in the night. I speak of this book because it is a means of educating those who need to understand the truth of the Word. This book should be highly appreciated. It covers much of the ground we have been over in our experience. If the youth will study this book and learn for themselves what is truth, they will be saved from many perils. End quote. I have hesitated for many years in presenting the things that I will be presenting, and it's been because I've not wanted to unsettle anyone's faith in the book Daniel and Revelation, and that's not my purpose uh, to do that. It's not my purpose to present anything new and strange. And in fact, the things that you will hear are, in fact, the old truths. But they're just set in a slightly different framework or presented from slightly different symbols. And I hope you'll bear with me and listen with an open mind these things. But as I mentioned, I have hesitated presenting these things. Not that I had it all figured out. I have hesitated to go further because of these endorsements of Daniel and Revelation. And I believe now that that was, was wrong. And we, we read in Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 60. And this is the editors speaking in the 90s of Elder Smith's books. One of the leaders in our call porter work asked Mrs. White, You believe they are inspired, do you not? Letter 15, 1895 to Mr. Frank Belden. Indicative of her recognition of the folly of the question, she replied, quote, You may answer that question. I shall not. So it seems from this statement that Ellen White considered it a foolish question to ask if it was if she considered the book inspired we all probably those who have a a background in the adventist message have a special interest and a special place in our hearts for william miller the spirit of prophecy highly endorsed william miller and and his work but more especially the spirit of prophecy endorsed william miller's teaching on the book of revelation 
On page 231 of Early Writings, we read, God directed the mind of William Miller to the prophecies and gave him great light upon the book of Revelation. Continuing, it says, If Daniel's visions had been understood, the people could better have understood the visions of John. But at the right time, God moved upon his chosen servant, who with clearness and in the power of the Holy Spirit opened the prophecies and showed the harmony of the visions of Daniel and John and other portions of the Bible, etc. And continuing, it says, Angels of God accompanied William Miller in his mission. He was firm, undaunted, and undaunted, fearlessly proclaiming the message committed to his trust. That's a pretty high endorsement that angels of God were accompanying him and that God directed his mind, particularly giving him great light upon the book of Revelation, as we read. And again, in Story of Redemption, page 356, it says God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed in the Bible to lead him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one to guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies which had ever been dark to God's people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given to him, and he was led on to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of God. He saw there a perfect chain of truth. That word which he had regarded as uninspired now opened before his vision in its beauty and glory. He saw that one portion of scripture explains another, and when one passage was closed to his understanding, he found in another part of the word that which explained it. He regarded the sacred word of God with joy and with deepest respect and awe. This is a pretty high recommendation of William Miller's work, a very strong endorsement of his understanding, particularly of the prophecies. And as we read earlier, it was prophecies of revelation that were included. But I want to ask a question. How many here believe that the leopard beast of Revelation 13 represents pagan Rome? And how many here believe that it was the pagan head that received the deadly wound? Probably not very many of us would believe that, but that is exactly what William Miller taught. I read, I read from William Miller, um, one of his books here, and you can see the quote hopefully on the screen. I'll have slides for you. John saw the blasphemous pagan head wounded to death and taken away, and the papacy take its place as a supreme head. Then the deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered when they saw the power of the Pope of the Roman Kingdom. And again, and they worshipped Justinian, the emperor of Rome, submitted to his arms in orthodoxy, and they worshipped the kingdom of Rome, saying, boastingly, who is able to make war with the kingdom of Rome? How many have understood that phrase, who is able to make war with, with him, to refer to the pagan Roman Empire? Haven't we understood that to refer to the papal Rome? And another question, how many here have understood that the beast with horns like a lamb represents papal Rome? The beast with horns like a lamb in Revelation 13. How many here have believed that that beast represents papal Rome? I don't think too many of us would answer yes. We have understood that historically as representing the United States of America. Yet William Miller says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. What other kingdom is this? I answer, it must be an image of the one just described. It must be an ecclesiastical kingdom, for it has or pretends to have two powers of Christ, the Lamb of God. It also speaks with the same authority as the Roman emperors before him. It is evident, then, that it is the next succeeding ecclesiastical Roman, Empire, Roman power to the imperial power of Rome, and must, of course, mean the papacy. So William Miller believed that the beast with horns like a lamb represented the papacy. 
How many here believe that the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast, that it represents baptism as a Catholic? I don't think too many people would would uh, agree to that. But yet, that's what William Miller preached. It says here, And he, Papal Rome, caused all under his authority, from the infant in its mother's arms, to the aged man of many years, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive the mark of initiation and confirmation into the Church of Rome, under the control of this ecclesiastical power. The initiation rite, which they call baptism and regeneration, is performed in their foreheads, and the confirmation or token of fellowship by the right hand. These marks bring them into full fellowship and communion with the great body of the Roman Church, and were both established by a law of the Roman Church. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. No man during the reign of papacy, where the laws of papacy were supreme, could buy or sell or use any lawful trade except such as were initiated into the Roman Church, had a name in this Roman Church or kingdom, and were numbered with the multitude in the great association of this blasphemous power. So William Miller placed all of this um, beast and its mark and the number of its name, etc., all in the past, in the far distant past. The number 666. How many here would believe or do believe that the number 666 represents the time of pagan role, pagan Rome reigning. I doubt whether very many here would agree to that. And that the image to the beast is actually the papacy itself. Yet these things are what William Miller taught. Notice again, Miller says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. What is the number of a man? It is the number of his days or the years of his life, etc. The number of the years of the Roman kingdom under its first blasphemous head of paganism was 666 years, beginning B.C. 158 and ending in 508. It being 666 years that pagan Rome reigned as the supreme power over the earth. And was that bloody persecuting power over the people of God, which destroyed the city and sanctuary and trod down the holy people until its power was taken away to make room for the image beast of papacy, which reigned supreme 42 months or 1260 years. Brothers and sisters, I'm not recommending any of these teachings that William Miller promoted. My point is that, that the spirit of prophecy highly endorsed William Miller's teaching on the book of Revelation. But that did not mean that it was inerrant. It did not mean that it was without flaw or perfect in any way. And, and I believe that we have made the same mistake in exalting the book of Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. We read here in Great Controversy, 1888 edition, page 291, For my part, I cannot sufficiently bewail the condition of the Reformed churches who are come to a period in religion and will go no further than the instruments of their reformation. And Ellen White is quoting, quoting a, a pastor. The Lutherans cannot be drawn to go any further than what Luther saw, and the Calvinists, you see, stick fast where they were left by that great man of God, who yet saw not all things. This is a misery much to be lamented, for though they were burning and shining lights in their time, yet they penetrated not into the whole counsel of God. But were they now living, would be as willing to embrace further light as that which they first received. End quote. And brothers and sisters, we should be very careful that we don't make these statements say more than they do. 
Some people read into Matthew 28, 19, a trinity, when it is not there. Some have read into the, these statements above that these men were divinely inspired and everything they believed and wrote was inspired, and that is just not there. This has caused precious time to be wasted in needless arguing about things like the King of the North, the Daily, Revelation 17, and more. And instead of studying the Word to learn for ourselves what is the truth that is to prepare us for the great day of God, they've been spending their time arguing and discussing these things instead of sitting down and studying with an open mind and sharing and, and seeking for truth. I want to present to you at this time some observations that I have made over the years about Revelation 17. These are observations which have led me to conclude that the scenes of Revelation 17, depicting a confederacy of the ten horns with the beast and the great harlot to make war with the Lamb, are present in future tense, not past, and that the identity of the beast of Revelation 17 the seven heads and the ten horns, as interpreted in Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, is not correct. As much regard as I have for the man and the book and the teachings of virtually the entire book I hold to be true and I teach to this very day, I have found some things which I believe are not correct and I don't believe I'm going beyond inspiration rejecting the endorsements that inspiration is placed upon the book in doing this. Observation number one concerning a short space. And this is concerning the book or the chapter 17 of Revelation. A short space that the seventh head was to rule cannot refer to the exarch of Ravenna. That's my observation. Revelation 17 10 says, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh he must continue a short space. So the the seventh king is said to reign a, a short space. And my observation is this cannot refer to the exarch of Ravenna. The phrase short space in Revelation 17 10 seems to receive its specific interpretation from the context. It can indicate a duration, amount, degree, number, etc. But not only is the measurement scale qualified by the context, it also seems to be quantified. Thus it is translated in 1 Peter 5.10, a while, and a season in 1 Peter 1.6 to indicate a portion of one's life, perhaps years. In James 4.14, it's translated a little time, referring to one's entire life. In Revelation 12.12, 12, a short time refers to the last 2,000 years Satan has had to work. It is a short time in comparison with eternity, or with the previous 4,000 years that he has been at work. But it is still a long time compared with our lifespan, or a few fish, as it is translated elsewhere. In Revelation 17.10, it is translated a short space for the time in which the seventh king would rule. But this must be compared with its context, and the context is the time that the other kings ruled. If this refers to the 60 years during which time the exarch of Ravenna ruled, it does not make sense that it would be called a short space in distinction from the other six kings or mountains, when several of the others were even far shorter than it. For example, the Decemvri, from 451 to 449 B.C., just over two years. The triumviri, the first for about seven years and the second for about five years, ending in 37 B.C., making a total of 12 years. And, thirdly, in the first century, dictatorship was forcefully imposed by Sulla for three years, Later, it was conferred upon Caesar by the Senate for ten years, but in fact it only lasted a few days, for it ceased in just a few days when he was assassinated. The dictatorship that existed for several hundred years, from the fifth to the first centuries, were not a new form of government, but appointed by the Senate for a short period of six months 
or less only during times of emergency, such as attack. It was not a new form of government, but a provision of the existing Republican government, run by the Senate. Like executive orders during times of emergency, exercised by various forms of government during our time even. So, so once again, the decemviri ruled just over two years. It was not called a short time. The triumviri for seven years. It was not called a, a short time. The dictatorship was actually only in place for about three years total. And that was when it was forcefully imposed by Sula and not, not actually constitutional or, or legal. And the dictatorship was simply actually a part of a provision that was made by the ruling Senate. All three of these so-called forms of government were far shorter than the Exarch of Ravenna, which ruled for 54 to 60 years. Observation number two. The Exarch of Ravenna was appointed by the Roman Emperor in Constantinople. So should it really be considered a separate government? Observation number three. Odysseur of the Heruli and Theodoric of the Ostrogoths, who filled the office of the Exarch of Ravenna, were both represented, represented as horns among the ten horns on the beast. How then can they also constitute one of the seven heads? The papacy also was one of the horns. How then can it also be one of the heads? Observation 4. It could just as accurately be said that there were only four different forms of government in, Roman, in the Roman Empire, not seven. Because prior to 509 BC, the government was monarchical. From 509 BC until Augustus Caesar became emperor in 27 BC, the government was republic. And in 27 BC, it became imperial. Later, it became papal. But this would be just four heads, not seven. These four seem more to be forms of government than the decemviri appointed by the Senate, or the consuls who were appointed by the Senate, or the triumviri which were appointed or ratified by the Senate, and the dictatorship which was authorized and ratified by the Senate simply as an emergency power for a specified period of time. So, so it's hard for me to to understand how we, we can say that these were actually seven forms of government. Observation number five. Now, heads on a beast represent governments, not forms of government. The four heads of the leopard beast of Daniel 7 represented four different governments, according to Daniel 8.22, where it uh, depicts the same thing as four horns even waging war upon each other with distinct places for their seats of government and distinct borders and territories. These heads were governments, not forms of government. Observation number six. The spirit of prophecy says that the beast that ascended from the bottomless pit is the atheistical power that ruled in France during the revolution of 1789. Thus, it cannot be the papacy Quote, from great controversy, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Revelation 11.7, the atheistical power that ruled in France during the revolution and the reign of terror did wage such a war against God and his holy word as the world had never witnessed. The worship of the deity was abolished by the National Assembly. Bibles were collected and publicly burned with every possible manifestation of scorn. The law of God was trampled underfoot. The institutions of the Bible were abolished. The weekly rest day was set aside, and instead, every tenth day was devoted to reveling and blasphemy. Baptism and communion were prohibited, and announcements posted conspicuously over the burial places declared death to be an eternal sleep. This is a quote from Great Controversy that says clearly the beast that ascended from the bottomless pit is this atheistical power that ruled 
in France during the Revolution. It cannot then be the papacy. The reference uh, we are referring to is Revelation 17.8, where it says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And this beast is referred to in Revelation 11.7 that was quoted in Great Controversy that I just read and applied to France. Revelation 17.11, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. This is the other reference there to that beast. Furthermore, no evidence is presented that bottomless pit signifies the basing of your power on a mixture of Christian errors and pagan superstitions. To the contrary, as we have seen, Great, con great Controversy says that the beast from the bottomless pit is the atheistic power that ruled in France during the French Revolution. Observation number seven. The phrase was and is not and yet is cannot simply refer to the persecution which at times ceased and then started again. The text says, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. It was the beast itself, which was also the eighth head, and thus the government represented by the head, which is said to be was, is not, and yet is. The scripture clearly then refers to a government, not simply a policy, when it says that it was, is not, and shall arise. Observation number eight. There are two phrases which reference events in relation to a specific time. These phrases read, number one, five kings are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. Revelation 17.10. And the second phrase is, Quote the beast that was and is not and shall ascend. Revelation 17.8 Logically, these time references should be referenced from the same time frame as each other since there is nothing in the text to indicate otherwise. There is no textual justification for making the time frame for one of those phrases be the time of John and the other 400 years later under the Exarch of Ravenna. I see no textual justification for that. Number nine. The woman is said to be sitting upon the seven heads and upon many waters, which are defined to be peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Thus the seven heads cannot represent Rome alone. Revelation 17.1 and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Sitteth upon many waters. And verse 9, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Clearly, it's more than one nation. Clearly, it's, it's multitudes and nations and tongues and peoples. So this cannot represent Rome alone. Observation number 10. The ten horns hating the whore, making her desolate, eating her flesh, and burning her with fire, cannot be something that began in the past, but this is yet future, and for the following reasons. Number one, because it cannot be said to be in the process of being destroyed while it is in the zenith of its power and before it receives the worship of the whole world. Revelation 13, 12. And unites with the other world powers in enforcing its mark and taking part in the last great war with the Lamb. Quote, in Revelation 17, 14 to 16, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. 
and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. These things just cannot be passed. And I just gave you reason number one, that the whole world is said to be wandering after the beast. It receives worship from the whole world and unites with these other world powers and in making its war with the Lamb and persecuting God's people. How can it be said to have already been made desolate and having your flesh eaten? Number two reason is Revelation 16, 19 places the destruction of Babylon under the seventh plague, not 200 years before the coming of Christ. Revelation 16, 19. Number three, Revelation 19, 20 reveals that the destruction of the beast, that is the papacy, and the false prophet, Protestant USA, takes place at the same time. And surely no one would contend that the USA has already been destroyed. And the fourth reason I cannot accept that this destruction of the whore, that it began in the past, Revelation 18.21 says that a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. If the graphic language of the angel means anything, it certainly cannot refer to a gradual decline of power, beginning in the 1700s and extending into the 21st century at the coming of Christ. How many have seen a millstone? Here in Philippines, we use, um, we use our neighbor's stone mill. It's, you have to turn it by hand and grind our corn, we grind our adlai, etc., and if you throw that into the water, it's going to, to be a sudden and thorough engulfing of the stone, and it's gone. And, and this says that this is the way Babylon is thrown down, not a gradual decline. And the fifth reason is that it is one of the seven angels that pours out the seven last plagues that shows John the judgment of the whore. Revelation 17.1 so it would not make sense that its judgment takes place over 200 years before that time. Brothers and sisters, we need to study for ourselves, and we need to know the truth for ourselves. We read in Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 65, Many who are serving as gospel ministers need to study the Word. Revelation means something revealed, which all are to understand. Dig deep for the truth. Plead with the Lord for an understanding of His Word. Those who feel their need of the special help of God will ask Him who is the source of all wisdom to supply their necessities. Ask Him to enlighten your understanding that you may know how to give light to others. Put your mind to the tax. Never rest satisfied with a partial knowledge of the truth pieced out with some weak suppositions. Brothers and sisters, we read in Psalms 91, verse 4, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. And what is this covering? It says, His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Brothers and sisters, it's truth that we need. I encourage you and I exhort you to study, to study your Bibles because the times we're living in demand that we be covered with the covering of the Almighty. This is my prayer. Heavenly Father, we need truth. We need to not be afraid to study truth and to know it for ourselves. And we need to be kept at the same time from going to one extreme or the other or for, from accepting one wind of doctrine after another. And I pray that you will, will bring, as you have promised, bring from the Word of God, from the book of Revelation, truths that will cause, that will set in motion a mighty movement. And I pray that hearts will be receptive tonight to the messages. 
In Jesus' name, amen.